Thank you so much, Tanya. Tana is a good friend of mine, and I am so happy that you guys have such an amazing pastor. Um, my husband, just to toot Tanya's horn a little bit, my husband always tells me, Tanya is such a good pastor. And um, he's like, I'm going to copy her. And I'm like, go ahead, copy her. <laughs> if somebody's doing it well already, why not um, just follow in their footsteps? So thank you so much, Tanya, for inviting me here today. And thank you, Laguna Miguel SDA Church, for having me today. Just before I begin, I'm going to pray, just because your girl is nervous because she hasn't spoken in front of a church in quite a few years, actually. I don't know if it's years, maybe a few months. Um, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to speak in front of your people, your saints, Lord, the people who desire to be near you. Father, I pray that you hide me behind your cross, that your Holy Spirit just takes over right now, Lord, because even though I have written down words, even though I have a sermon prepared, I know that your Holy Spirit is going to fill in in those spaces where you need to speak to someone today. And I want to thank you ahead of time because I know you're going to do that and I'm okay with it, Lord. I am your instrument, I am your vessel, and I'm just here to talk about you. Lord, I pray a special blessing upon each person that is inside of this church right now. And I pray that your Holy Spirit be inside of them as well, Lord. I ask this all in your name. Amen. All right, so as you can see, the title of my sermon is How One Dog Changed the Church. Now, I don't know about you guys. As you saw in my picture, I don't have a dog. I have a cat. I'm actually a cat person, but um, I live in San Diego now. My husband is pastoring at Paradise Valley Church over there, and San Diego is a very dog-friendly city. I did not know that people were this into dogs. How many of you guys have dogs in this congregation? Oh, very few. I guess Laguna Niguel is not a dog-friendly city. I can see that. Okay. Well, if you didn't know this, you're going to know some statistics today. 471 million pet dogs in the world. Cool thing, that picture that you see in the background is actually a tribe in Papua New Guinea that actually uses dogs to hunt while they're out in the forest. Love it so much. They have pet dogs too. It's not just America. 30, uh, not 30, 76 million pet dogs in the U.S. And then 32% of households in California have dogs Clearly, that's not reflected here in this church, but that's okay. Like I said, I'm in San Diego. It is the fourth most dog-friendly city in America. I went out to eat with Tanya and Philip the other day, maybe a few months ago, probably last year, and they had dog bowls. They were a dog-friendly place. Like I said, I'm a cat person, so I didn't know a lot of this, but coming to California, I realized people love dogs. But this is something different. When we look in the scriptures, we see something different. We don't necessarily see dogs as something that are nice and friendly. No, 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 no. According to the Journal of Semitics, there is an article by Alec Basson, and he says, dogs kept the towns clean by consuming garbage carrion, which I didn't know what that was, so I had to look it up on Google, which means rotting flesh, and unburied corpses. Given that they were viewed as scavengers, filthy, aggressive, and insatiable dogs were not allowed to enter houses. Some of y'all have dogs in your houses. It was considered a horrible fate to have one's corpse eaten or one's blood licked by dogs rather than having a proper burial. This was considered the ultimate in tragic events, an end to someone's life. You remember some of those stories in scripture, right? Where they were like, and her flesh was eaten by dogs. And you're like, oh my God. Yeah, that was supposed to be like, that is the ultimate tragic end to your life. You are so disrespected that the dogs ate your flesh when you died. Jezebel. Yeah, Jezebel. Jezebel was one of them. 
That was the story of Jezebel, unfortunately. So today we'll be talking about an unnoticed dog that didn't necessarily change the world at the time, but did change the church forever. And we will be in Matthew 15 this morning. But before I dive into this text, I want you to understand why am I even talking about some of these previous texts before we get to the main text. So we're going to start in Matthew 15. If you want to get your Bibles out, go ahead and get it out. I will have it on the screen as well for you. But um, I'm going to be going through the previous stories and then getting to the main story because, see, the literary writer, the, the author of Matthew, had some, you know, artistic devices that they were using at the time. This person was trying to make a point. So we're going to read the previous stories to see this point that Matthew, the book, is trying to get at. So let's dive into it. Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Jesus answered them, Why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother... But what's going on here? And whoever speaks evil of your father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells your father or mother whatever support, and and I'm going to try to translate this because honestly I read this text a few times and I was a little confused. Basically what he's saying here is whatever support you might have had from me is given to God. So mom and dad are, are coming up to you, children, children that are in here. Mom and dad have taken care of you all your life. They've raised you. They sent you to private school. They're sending you to university. They, they, they have prepared your meals every day. At one point, they come to you and they say, hey, I need help. And they say, oh, you say to your parent, I'm so sorry. I gave all my money to the church. I can't help you. I gave my, my land to the church. I'm sorry. I have no room for you in my house. I'm using it for ministry so I can't help you. So this is what God is getting at, where Jesus is getting at in this text. For the sake of your own tradition, you make void the word of God, you hypocrite. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, and I'm going to try to go to the next slide here, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine. How many of you guys know about doctrine? We all know a little bit about doctrine, right? We're good church-going people, so we understand that Scripture shows us doctrine. And here, Jesus is saying, you guys made a doctrine that you got to give everything to Jesus, and if somebody in your household is not being fed, that's okay. That's okay. They honored him with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. Jesus is going in on the Pharisees. He's going in. He's exposing them for their own deceptions. They had started to think of all kinds of different rules, and and, and they start getting angry at Jesus' disciples. They're getting angry because they're following, they're not following the purification rituals, But, we're going to go to the next slide here. As Ellen White said in Desire of Ages, while people were occupied with trifling, one of my favorite words, trifling distinctions and observances, which God had not required, their attention was what? Turned away from the great principles of the law. So interesting. They were focused on the wrong thing. That's what Ellen White's getting at. They were focused on the wrong thing. They started to limit the law, the great principles of the law of God with purification rituals. It's not that they were saying, oh, we're going to disobey the law. No, no, no. They were like, we're going to add some stuff to it. We're going to make it more specific so that some of those greater things in life, some of those greater principles of the law we're not paying attention to. Instead, we're focusing on the very specific. That's not what Jesus was trying to do. We're going to see that this 
this dog that we're going to speak of later on is going to expand the way that we look at the law. But here, we're not going to focus too much on what, what's going on with the Pharisees because we're not here for the Pharisees. The Pharisees are going to do what they're going to do and they're going to, you know, they're going to limit the law. They're going to limit it by making these small little deals, you know, these little things that you've got to pay attention to so that we ignore the great principles of the law. They focus their vision in the wrong place so we're not going to talk about too much about that. They pay their money to the church. They give their time to the church. But then Jesus starts asking, how is your family? But Jesus walks away from this frustrating conversation. I won't get too much into that. And the religious teachers of the land, and he just says, you know what? You guys don't get it. You just don't get it. So then he walks away, and he starts to walk with his friends, the people he had chosen, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all the people that he's been hanging out with, Peter, Paul, well, not Paul, but later on. Um, he's walking around with his disciples, and we're going to go to the next slide. Sorry, this thing is not working. Um, and then he starts talking to them. So he's frustrated with the Pharisees, and he walks away, and he's like, you know, all right, come on, disciples, let's go. So they go. And then now we're at Matthew 15, 8 through 20. We're not at the great story yet. Not there yet. We're just setting it up. We're just setting it up. So he called the people to him and he said, hear and understand. He's talking to the disciples. Hear and understand this. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, hey, I don't know if you knew this, Jesus, but the Pharisees were very offended by that. They were very, I don't know if you realize this, but when you said that, the Pharisees were offended. He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not been planted, has not planted, will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Again, he's like, you know what, just forget them. Like, they don't get it. They don't get it. I'm, I'm talking to you guys now. But then Peter says, explain the parable to us. And he says, are you still, Jesus is getting like even more frustrated at this point. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you're trying to explain things to people. People are just not getting it. So he, he's getting frustrated. He says, you want me to explain the parable to you? I literally, I'm telling you because you're supposed to understand. Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into your mouth passes in the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the mouth come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile anyone. That's not what it's about. Another frustrating conversation for Jesus. I don't know if he actually got frustrated. I'm kind of projecting. I would be frustrated by this. But another conversation where people are not understanding. First it was with the Pharisees. Now it's with his disciples. The people are still Jews. They're Israelites. They, are, they have some understanding of Scripture. Do they not? But they're just not getting the concept. They just aren't getting it. They don't get that you can be dirty on the outside and pure on the inside. You can look like a million bucks on the outside, like a real saint. But inside, you're harboring hate, and it's eating away at your soul. But they don't get it. They still think that they are, you know, that it's not really necessary and that they need to follow the, the rituals and need to act and, you know, dress a certain way in order to be a part of the people of God. So then finally we get to our main meat. And Jesus went away from there. Again, he walks away. So he was with the Pharisees. He walks away. He goes to the disciples. He's trying to talk to them. They don't get it. He walks away. So then he goes to Tyre and Sidon. Do you see a pattern here? He's like, first, let me start with the seminary. He talks to them, and they're like, nah, they don't get it. Then he goes to the church, and nah, they don't get it. So this time he goes to the club, and he says, let me try there. Maybe they'll get it. I'm going to go to Tyre and Sidon. If you guys know anything about Tyre and Sidon, it's not necessarily the most pure place according 
to what maybe the Jews would think, correct? So he went away from there and he withdrew from the district into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Let me just pause for a moment here. I don't know about you guys, but I did not notice this until I read this scripture again, that another literary device here, behold. Do you guys know that word, behold? Behold is kind of like, ooh, something's about to happen. It's, it's kind of like one of those, I don't know if how many Latinos are in here, but when somebody says, ojo, they're telling you, watch out, something's about to happen. Like, what, ojo, like, look at that person. Behold is happening right now. Behold, and then comma, a Canaanite woman. Like, it's kind of like, a, like an entrance, like a, like a stage entrance for this woman. This author is saying, behold, it's not a normal word. It's a clue. It's a shift. It's a change as to what's about to happen in this next part. Matthew says, behold a Canaanite woman. And Matthew is probably saying this in shock. I don't know if any of you guys have seen The Chosen, but The Chosen, I love The Chosen series. But he, it's kind of, I really imagine Matthew from The Chosen writing down in shock as to what's happening right now. Like, behold, you should have seen what was happening here. It was kind of crazy. The Canaanites were known as pagan idol worshipers. This woman was known as a pagan idol worshiper who had a bad relationship with the Jews. So there was definitely a lot of bias here. This is not someone that you want showing up at your doorstep. Cuban-American theologian Kat Armas mentioned the word came out. So I emphasized it here. Came out further emphasized something important here. She's a Canaanite woman who dared to step out of the places that she was welcome. She stepped out of Canaan. She stepped out of Tyre and Sidon, and she met with Jesus. She came out of her separate part of town and showed up on the doorsteps of holiness. Jesus just had a conversation with the disciples about what defiles a person, and then this woman shows up someone he should not be associating with. She's from those parts of town. But she's also identified as a mother. And I'm sure there are many mothers here because, I mean, there wouldn't be any people here if there wasn't mothers, correct? She's identified as a mother who is severely, she's desperate because her daughter is severely suppressed by a demon. I think the next part is kind of hard. It's hard for a lot of us, actually. What's Jesus' response to this woman? Silence. Absolute silence. He ignores her. Completely ignores her. There's this desperate woman running up to him, and he just ignores her. He did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying for us. I was listening to a podcast on my way up here. And I was like, let me get some different perspectives. And it was this co- podcast called um, Voices. Ah, I, I'll tell you guys about it later. I forget what it's called. Something Voices. And these ladies were funny. They were talking about the Canaanite woman. And they were like, isn't it crazy? Look at, look at, what, look at this second text. Uh, no, that, not the, the first one on this side of the line. He did not answer her a word, right? So he ignores her. And then the disciples came and begged him. So the disciples are now like, okay, this woman is getting really annoying. She's coming and she's chasing after us. We're really annoyed here. Can you please send her away? For she is crying out after us. And these ladies on the podcast were like, who said they were there for you? They really thought that that lady was there for the disciples, when in reality, she was there for Jesus Christ. They really thought, she's crying out after us. Really, disciples? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe because you have the power of God. I don't know. But I think that was just really funny that they would say, who are you to think that we are there for you? We're here for Jesus. We're here for Jesus. So then he answered her with this, 
I was only sent, oh, sorry, we can go back. (laughs) I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The lost sheep of Israel. She's not, I mean, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. He's talking, Jesus is getting to the prophetic tale that is found in the scriptures, that Israel is the one that he loves, that Israel is the one that he's here for. That's who he's here for. David was a Jew. Abraham, technically a Jew. Jacob, a Jew. Israelites, these are the descendants of Abraham. These are people who we consider to be the part of the people of God. And then she shows up. But wait a minute. If I, if I look at the lineage of Jesus, we do see some moments with, like, Rahab, and then also, who was the other one? Ruth? I, but they married into the family, so, so maybe it's fine. Maybe it's fine. And, and maybe it's not something, this is just an anomaly. We have these odd women that sometimes become a part of the people of God. But is it really going to be the Canaanite woman? Is she going to be one of them? She was disadvantaged in every single type of way. She showed up alone. She was a Canaanite woman in a foreign land. She was a woman. She had so many things going against her. And it really should have discouraged her when she got ignored, when she got rejected, when the disciples were talking badly about her. I don't know if you guys ever get discouraged like that. Where someone's like, I hate it when I'm talking to someone and they ignore me. If they ignore me, that's like the ultimate disrespect. If I text someone and I see it's left on red for a long time, days, months, like I'm not texting you. You read that text. You haven't responded to me. I get it, though. Sometimes you get overwhelmed with texts. But then if you reject me or if you talk, if I find out you talk badly about me, Mm, again, not going to feel super great. Not going to want to hang out with you. If you tell me, I'm sorry, but I only am friends with people from Laguna Niguel, I'm going to be kind of upset again. I'm probably going to be like, you know what, fine. San Diego's so much better. (laughs) Just kidding, guys. There are so many ways that this woman was rejected again and again and again. She was ignored. She was left on red. She was rejected. She was told, you're not from here. Get out of here. And honestly, all of those things are really hard to hear. Honestly, if I heard someone treating someone else that way, I'd be upset. If I heard someone say, you're not from here, you should get out of here, I'd be pretty upset. If somebody said that to my husband, I would go off on them. But she persists. She keeps going. Next slide says this. But she came and she knelt down before him. And she said, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not right for me to help you. To take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, yes, Lord, I got you now, Jesus. Even the dogs in San Diego get water bowls at restaurants. Even the dogs will eat the crumbs from the master's table. She knew. She knew what was coming. She had a visionary view as to what the kingdom would be like. She said, even though dogs are seen as below, even though you reject me, you ignore me, you you insult me, all of that, God, you're giving me something because I know what dogs will be treated like. They will be sleeping in the beds of their masters at one point. She believes something else. 
She approaches Jesus to expand the net, not to limit it. She's not asking him to do less like the Pharisee. She's not confused like the disciples. She shows up and she says, I'm going to wrestle with you, which the pastor earlier, for those of you who were here in the Sabbath school, were ta- was talking about the wrestling with God. This woman wrestled with Jesus. She said, you may not want to bless me. You may say that you're not supposed to bless me. But guess what? You're going to bless me. And I'm going to wrestle through the insult, through the ignorance, through it all. I'm going to show up every day until you give me what I want. Commenting on the argument between Jesus and the Canaanite woman, and I call it an argument because it really is. She's using persuasive techniques. He's using persuasive techniques. He has a rule. She is going against that rule. And she's, and then so we have here um, Natalia con Rivera from the book Hermanas, which is a great book. I definitely um, suggest reading it. She talks about a lot of women in the Bible who often get overlooked. And she says this, Jesus spoke in parabolic language with the religious elite, like I was talking about earlier, with the Pharisees. She talked to them. Jesus talked to him. And then the uneducated disciples, and now this woman. However, what is interesting here is that she immediately speaks back to him in the same language. No one in all of the Gospels speaks back to him in this language. Most just walk away silent and confused. This woman was a revolutionary woman. She got it. All these other times, Jesus was like, gosh, I'm talking to the Pharisees. They just don't get it. And then he goes to the disciples and he's like, you still don't get it? So then he ends up at Tyre and Sidon and he says, finally, somebody gets it. Somebody gets it. What is, what is happening here? What is Jesus so excited about? Let's see in the next slide what happens here. Jesus says, that is so small. I'm going to have to walk up. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be done it for you as you desire. And her daughter was immediately healed. Instantly, she was healed. Jesus gets excited he gets so excited to see that all the, although the Pharisees didn't get it, although the disciples didn't get it, this Canaanite woman that was an idol worshiper that had nothing to do with the house of Israel gets it. He's like, finally, how great is your faith, woman? You understand. You get it. You get that I don't have that barrier. You get that my law is expansive. You get that I want my church to be filled of broken people. You get it. That is the dog that changed the world. A woman, an idolater, who came to Jesus and said, I need your help and I'm going to get it no matter what. God goes beyond our comfort. He's looking for this radical faith. He's looking and he's looking. He looks at the Pharisees and he says, do you have it? They say, no, sorry, we don't have it. He's like, at the disciples and they're like, oh, we don't get it. I'm sorry, God, we don't understand. And then he looks at her and she says, I get it. I get it, God, I get it. You want me to be a part of your kingdom. It's like a person who gets, is not invited to your wedding. This happened to me and my husband. Me and my husband had lots of friends in college, and we were just, like, nice people. And this guy came up to us, and he's like, hey, like, once when, when we got engaged, hey, like, I didn't get an invitation to your wedding. We're like, yeah, because you're not invited. But that boldness to say, hey, I'm invited, right? Like, you love me. You want me to be there. And sometimes Jesus is like, no, I didn't want you to be there. But this woman's like, no, you actually do. You do want me to be there. And he's like, good. I'm glad you realized that. I'm glad you persisted in front of the insult, in front of the the ignorance, in front of all of it. I'm glad you persisted. Jesus 
is looking for a faith like this. And I want you to see this pattern in the next slide. There's a pattern of faith. Luke 18, 7 through 8 says, And God will not bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when, I, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith like this on earth? And he's talking about the persistent woman. I don't know if you guys remember the story about the woman who goes to the judge and she says, I need to get my justice, I need to get my justice. And finally, the judge is like, fine, I'll give it to you. So persistent you are, woman, I'll give you the justice. Jesus is looking for that kind of faith. The faith that says, you know what? Even though you say, I'm not allowed to be here, Jesus, I'm going to be here. If you go into the next slide, another pattern, Matthew 8, Matthew 8, 10 says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith talking about the Roman soldier. Again, we're seeing a pattern here. Jesus is finding faith outside of the confines of the church. That's actually something to get excited about. I know that a lot of you are in here and you're like, yeah, but I'm in church, so I'm not that excited. That means he's not talking about me, he's talking about the people out there. Yeah, that's exciting. It's exciting for us to understand that we get to be a part of reaching out to people who already have this incredible faith that the Spirit is already working in them and they have boldness to show up and just be themselves. They're just like, hey, I'm here. So like, I, I didn't grow up in a religious household, I, but I can promise you that from the scraps of religion that I got, it was enough to transform my life. It was enough. It transformed me from the little that I got from every time my grandma would take me to church. My mom was not that religious, though. So when I came into the Seventh-day Adventist church, as you can imagine, I came with a fresh perspective. Let me just call it a fresh perspective. Because I didn't necessarily grow up with the confines of religion. My mom was very out there. I love her for it because she makes me bold too. So when I came into the church, as you can imagine, I offended a lot of people just by being there. But the thing is this. I was just showing up as my full self. I was just being real. I was just being myself. And I hadn't been taught to restrain any part of me. And I think sometimes we can think that we need to restrain ourselves when God has given us such a beautiful, full personality with ideas and vision. He wants us to push. He wants us to expand. He wants us to be, become a church that includes so many different kinds of people. Church members can get offended sometimes just because I think when we don't interact with the world, we kind of get used to that, you know? Especially, like, if we don't, like, some of us don't necessarily have jobs where we interact with people or make friends with people who are part of the world, quote-unquote. So we kind of get uncomfortable when people show up in churches and they're a little different, you know? I'll never forget in a family, uh, family member that I was speaking to. Like I said, so I didn't necessarily grow up in a Christian home but there are family members that like Christian values. They like it. They're like, yeah, good for you being a Christian. <laughs> so I just finished my second year at Southern Adventist University, and I had recently joined this ministry called Adventist Muslim Friendship Association. At that time, it was a different name, but I had joined that association, and it was such a fun time in my life. It was beautiful experiences where I was sitting down with refugees, with at the same table that were from Iraq, they were from Afghanistan, they were from Syria. It was this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful interaction that I was happening was happening with people. So I came back home and I was fired up. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Look at me using my faith for something. So then I sat down and I was talking to my family. And then they were like, so what did you do at Southern? And I was like, oh, like I gotta tell you, I was joined this organization and I'm sitting down with refugees and I'm talking to them every Saturday and it's amazing we share our faiths with each other and then they're like what why are you hanging out with those people I was like what what do you mean like why are you hanging out with Muslims I was like 
as Jesus would? They were like, hmm, as long as you're trying to convert them, that's okay. And I was like, wow, okay, 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 okay. This is kind of hard right now. My entire Christian journey at that point has never really been challenged as to what I should limit myself to, who I should hang out with, who I shouldn't hang out with. That, nobody had told me anything. They hadn't tried to stop me yet from trying to just be a Christian, live my life, interacting with people. But at that moment, that person told me, "Eh, you should limit that. Make that box a little smaller because you're impacting people that you shouldn't be impacting. Those are bad people. I was like, wow. This is weird. This feels weird. And, and then I started feeling self-conscious about it. I, I wouldn't talk about it as much because I felt like people would get angry at me because I was hanging out with Muslims. But that wasn't the last time. Later on, I would hang out with other people, and then people from church would tell me, hey, why are you hanging out with them? You should be careful. It's kind of hard to hear those things. It's kind of hard to hear those things. And I think it's because we just don't get it. The world doesn't get it. They don't get it. They don't get that we have this expansive, visionary view where everyone can sit at a table and share a meal. They don't get that. The world doesn't get that. I'm telling you right now, I, I'm in law school right now, and <laughs> I talk to people, and they're like, I am not sitting down with a Republican. I am not sitting down with a Democrat. Do not put me at that table. We will not get along. And I'm like, really? Really? And then I'll talk to church people, and they'll be like, really? I will not sit at a table with a Muslim. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. And I'm just like, really? Really? The Pharisees didn't get it. The disciples didn't get it. But the Canaanite woman, she understood. She understood that no matter what she was, that Jesus was going to love her. And she pursued that. She had the faith to believe that. Jesus finds faith among the persistent the brave, and the visionary. That is what Jesus desires for our churches. That is the faith that Jesus is looking to find when he comes back to this earth. He said, will I find that kind of faith that doesn't put up barriers between people, even if it's family members? I don't want to talk to that cousin. That cousin is so weird. Whatever it is, Whatever it is for each of us, whatever it is for this church, whatever it is for Laguna Niguel, whatever it is for California, the United States, this world, whatever it is, that is the faith that Jesus is going to be looking for.